Chapter 5 of the AEF, with General Pershing and the American Forces. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The AEF, with General Pershing and the American Forces, by Haywood Brown. Chapter 5 within sound of the guns. The men had traveled to Paris in passenger coaches, but when it came time to move the first division to its training area in the Vosges, our soldiers rode like all the other Allied armies in the famous cars upon which are painted Homme 36, Chevaux en long 8. And, of course, anybody who knows French understands the caption to mean that the horses must be put in lengthwise and not folded. No restrictions are mentioned as to the method of packing the om. The journey lay through gorgeous rolling country which was all a sparkle at this season of the year. Presently the vineyards were left behind and the hills became higher. Now and again there were fringes of pine trees. At one point it was possible to see a French captive balloon floating just beyond the hilltops, but we could not hear the guns yet. French soldiers in troop trains and camps near the track cheered the Americans, and even a few of the Germans inside a big stockade waved at the men who were moving forward to study war. The train stopped at a little town which lay at the foot of a hill. It was a mean little town. But on the hill was the fine old tower of a castle which had once dominated the surrounding country. From this town, which was chosen as divisional headquarters, regiments were sent northeast and northwest into tiny villages which were no more than a single line of houses along the roadway. A few one-story wooden barracks had been built for the Americans, but 90% of the men went into billets. They were quartered in the lofts of barns of the better sort. The billeting officers would not consider sheds where cattle had been kept. Few troops had been quartered in this part of the country previously, and so the barns were moderately clean. The effort to make cleanliness and sanitation something more than relative terms was the first thing which really threatened Franco-American amity. The decision of American officers that all manure piles must be removed from in front of dwelling houses met a startled and universal protest. Elderly French women explained with great feeling that the manure piles had been there as long as they could remember and that no one had ever come to any harm from them. The American officers insisted, and at last a grudging consent was forced. I saw one old lady almost on the point of tears as she watched the invaders demolish her manure pile. At last she could stand no more. They make a lot of dust, she said critically, and went into the house. A few days after the Americans arrived in camp came their instructors. A crack division of Alpine Chasseurs was chosen to teach the Americans. Nobody called these men froggies. They called them chassers. It was enough to see them march to know that they were fighting men. Their stride was short and quick. Each step was taken as if the marcher was eager to have it over and done with so that he could take another. Even their buglers won admiration, for they had a trick of throwing their instruments in the air and catching them again that brought envy to the heart of every American band. Indeed, a good deal of friendly rivalry developed from the beginning and in the early days at least, the French had all the better of it. They could lift heavier weights than our men, who averaged much younger. Little Frenchmen standing five feet three or four would seize a rifle close to the end of the bayonet and slowly raise it with stiff arm to horizontal and down again. American farmer boys tried and failed. Of course, this was a crack French division which drew its men from various organizations while our division was just the average lot, and perhaps not quite that, since there was a larger percentage of recruits than is usually found in the regular army. Although our men were somewhat outclassed by their instructors in these early days, they were game in their effort to keep up competition. Almost the first work to which the troops were set was trench digging. This is one of the most important arts of war, and also the most tiresome. 
Somebody has said of the Canadians, they will die in the last ditch, but they won't dig it. The Americans have a similar aversion for work with pick and shovel, but trench digging came to them as a competition. I saw a battalion of the chasseurs and a battalion of marines set to work in a field where every other blow of the pick hit a rock. There was no chance to loaf, for when a marine looked over his shoulder, he could see the French picks going for dear life down at the other end of the trench. At 4.30, the men were told to call it a day. The chasseurs leaped out of their trench, threw down their tools, and began to sing at top voice a popular Parisian love ditty entitled Il Faut de l'Amour. One of the French officers told me afterwards that it was the invariable custom of his men to sing at the end of work, but the Marines thought the chassers were merely showing off the excellent nature of their wind. More slowly, the Americans clambered out of their trench, but they were ready when the last French note died away and piped up somewhat breathlessly, Hail, hail, the gang's all here. American company commanders were quick to appreciate the value of organized singing in the training of troops, and for the next few days the doughboys were drilled to lift their voices as well as their picks. Most of all, music was appreciated in the long hikes of the early training period. A good song did much to make a marching man forget that he had a 50-pound pack on his back. I know I'm beginning to get a real company now, one captain told me, because whenever they're beginning to feel tired, they start to sing and freshen up. No, he said, in reply to a question, they didn't just start. It needed a little fixing. I noticed that when the Frenchmen stopped work, they always started back to camp singing. We can do that. I told my men when we started back, let's hear a little noise. Nothing happened. Nobody wanted to begin. They were scared the others would laugh at them. I can't carry a tune two feet, but I just struck up, we'll hang the damned old Kaiser to a sour apple tree, to the tune of John Brown's body. A few joined in, but most of them wouldn't open their mouths. I told them, I'm just going to keep on marching this company until everybody's in on the song. I don't care if we have to march all night. That got them going. Now they like it. They're thinking up new songs every day. I can save my voice now. One of the reasons for sending the men into the Vosges for training was to get them within sound of the guns, but it was almost a week before we heard any of the doings at the front. It was at night time that we first heard the guns. It was a still, windless night, and along about eight o'clock they began. You couldn't be quite sure whether you heard them or felt them, but something was stirring. It felt or sounded a good deal as if some giant across the hills had slammed the door of his castle as he left home to take the morning train for business. Up at the northern end of the training area, the sound of the guns was much more distinct. In fact, they were loud enough some nights to become identified in the mind as events and not mere rumblings. A Sammy up in that village stopped our car one morning and asked if we couldn't give him a newspaper. I suppose you want to know how the baseball games are coming out, somebody suggested. To hell with baseball, I want to know about the war, said the soldier. I'm with these mules, he said, pointing to half a dozen animals tethered on the bank of a canal. I've been with them right from the beginning. I came over on the same steamer with them. I rode up with them in the train from, and here we are again. I don't hear nothing. They could capture Berlin and nobody tell me about it. All I do is feed these damned mules. Big Bill, that one on the end, is sick, and I've got to hang around and give him a pill every six hours. I wish he'd choke. I don't like him as well as the rest of the mules, and I hate them all. It'll be fine, won't it, when somebody asks me, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? And I say, oh, I sat up with a sick mule. Back of the hills from some indefinite distance came the sound of big guns. They raged persistently for ten minutes and then quit. Big Bill began to rear around and kick. The soldier cursed him. Those guns were going like that all night, but mostly around two o'clock, he said, Nobody around here knows anything about it. I wish I could get hold of an American paper and find out something about that fight. 
I've sent to Memphis for the new scimitar, but somehow it don't seem to get here. I wish those guns was near enough to drop something over here on the mules, especially Big Bill, but I'm out of luck. The nearest approach of the war was in the air. It wasn't long before German planes began to scout over the territory occupied by the Americans. One battalion almost saw an air fight. It would have seen it if the Major hadn't said, attention, just then. The battalion was drilling in a big open meadow when there came from the east first a whirr and then a machine. The machine, flying high, circled the field. The soldiers who were standing at ease stared up at the visitor, but it was too high to see the identifying marks. Soon there was no doubt that the machine was German, for little white splotches appeared in the sky. It looked as if Charlie Chaplin had thrown a cream pie at heaven and it had splattered. An anti-aircraft gun concealed in a wood several miles away was firing at the bush. Presently the firing ceased and there was a whir from the west. A French plane flew straight in the direction of the German, who climbed higher and higher. As the planes drew nearer, it was possible to see machine gun flashes, but just then the Major called his men to attention. Regulations provide that eyes must look straight ahead, but it was a hard test for recruits and there may have been one or two who stole a glance up there where the planes were fighting. In each case, an officer was on the culprit like a flash. Keep your head still, shouted a lieutenant. That's a private fight. It's got nothing to do with you. Soon the German turned and flew back in the direction of his own lines, and when the necks of the doughboys were unfettered and they could look up again, the sky was clear. Even the cream puff splotches were gone. On another afternoon, a Bosch plane flew over the entire American area. It circled a field and divisional headquarters where a baseball game was in progress and flew home. I know why that German flew home after he reached, an officer explained. Don't you see? He was trying to find out if we were Americans, and that baseball game proved it to him. The greatest aerial display occurred on a morning when a French officer was instructing an American company in the art of trench digging. He spoke no English, but an interpreter of a sort was making what shift he could. The doughboys tried to look interested and didn't succeed. It was harder when out from behind a cloud came one aeroplane, then another, and another. When half a dozen had appeared from behind the cloud, one doughboy could stand the strain no longer. Look, he shouted, they're hatching them up there. The French instructor finally granted a recess of ten minutes, but before the time was up, the planes had maneuvered out of sight. In spite of all the German activity in the air, only one attempt was made to bomb the Americans during the summer. A single bomb was dropped on a village where the Marines were stationed, but it did no damage. The second week in the training area found the doughboys increasing their curriculum to include bombs and machine guns. It had not been possible to do much in the finer arts of war previously because of the absence of interpreters. A number of these had been mobilized now, but they varied in quality. As one American officer put it, interpreters may be divided into three classes, those who know no English, those who know no French, and those who know neither. However, the Americans managed to get their instruction in some way or other. No interpreters were needed with the machine guns. Instead, each American company was divided up into little groups and the chasseur placed at the head of each group. I watched the instruction and found that little language was needed. The Frenchman would take a machine gun or automatic rifle apart and holding up each part give its French name. The Americans paid no particular attention to the outlandish terms which the French used for their machine gun parts, but they were alert to notice the manner in which the gun was put together, and in the group in which I was standing, two Americans were able to put the gun together without having any parts left over after a single demonstration. Of course, a little language was used. Some of the Marines had picked up a little very villainous French in Haiti, and they made what shift they could with that. A few French Canadians and an occasional man from New Orleans could converse with the chasseur, and one or two phrases had been acquired by men hitherto entirely ignorant of French. Qu'est-ce que c'est was used by the purists as their form of interrogation, 
but there were others who tried to make Combien do the work. Combien, which we pronounced Combien, was stretched for many purposes. I have heard it used and accepted as an equivalent for whereabouts, what did you say, why, which one, and will you please show us once more how to put that machine gun together. Not only did the Americans show an aptitude for getting the hang of the mechanism of the machine gun and the automatic rifle, but they shot well with them after a little bit of practice. The first man I watched at work with the automatic rifle was Green. He had taken the gun apart and put it together again with an occasional regardé and bit of demonstration from one of the Frenchmen, but the weapon was not yet his pal. He picked the gun up somewhat gingerly and aimed at the line of targets a couple of hundred yards away. Then he pulled the trigger and the bucking thing, which seemed to be intent on wriggling out of his arms, sprayed the top of the hill with bullets. The French instructor made a laughing comment, and an American who spoke the language explained, he says you ought to be in the anti-aircraft service. The next man to try his luck was a non-commissioned officer long in the army. He patted the gun and wooed it a little in whispers before he shot. It was a French gun, to be sure, but the language of firearms is international. Behave, Betsy, he said, and she did. He sprayed shots along the line of targets at the bottom of the hill as the gun clattered away with all the clamor of a riveting machine at seven in the morning. When they looked at the targets, they found he had scored 30 hits out of 34, and some were bullseyes. The French instructor was so pleased that he stepped forward as if to hug the ancient sergeant, but the veteran's look of horror dissuaded him. Bombing proved the most popular part of training, and particularly as soon as it was possible to work with a live article. First of all, dummy bombs were issued. A French officer carefully explained that the bomb should be thrown after four moves, counting one, two, three, four, as he posed something like a shot putter before he let the bomb go with an overhead, stiff, armed fling. He illustrated the method several times, but the first American to throw sent the bomb spinning out on a line just as if he were hurrying a throw to first from deep short. The Frenchman reproved him and explained carefully that, although it might be possible to throw a bomb a long way in the manner in which a baseball is thrown, it was necessary for a bomber to hurl many missiles and that he must preserve his arm. He also pointed out that the bomb would never land in the trenches of the enemy unless it was thrown with a considerable arc. The men then kept the exercises laid down by the instructor, but just before they stopped, one or two could not resist the temptation of again putting something onto it and letting the bomb sail out fast. One left-hander, who had pitched for a season in the Southern League, was anxious to make some experiments to see if he couldn't throw a bomb with an outcurve, but he was informed that such an accomplishment would have no military utility. The first American wounded in France was the victim of a bombing accident. A soldier threw a live bomb more than 30 meters from a trench. When the bomb burst, a fragment came whirling back in some curious manner and fell into a box of grenades upon which a lieutenant was sitting. The fragment cut the pin of one of the bombs and the whole box went off with a bang. The lieutenant received only a slight cut on his forehead but a French interpreter 30 yards away was knocked unconscious and lost the sight of his right eye. This Frenchman had spent two years under fire at Verdun without being scratched, and here was his first wound come upon him on a quiet afternoon in a meadow miles from the lines. The men threw bombs from deep trenches, and they were instructed to keep cover closely after hurling a grenade just as if there was a German trench across the way. But curiosity was too strong for them. Each wanted to see where his particular bomb hit and how much earth it would tear up. The bombs made only small scars in the earth, but they sent fragments of steel casing flying in all directions, and several men were cut about the face by splinters. The seeming inability of the American to visualize battle conditions in training retards his progress in spite of his aptitude in other directions. A French officer was directing a platoon of Americans one day in skirmishing. They were to fire around, run forward 20 paces, throw themselves flat, and run forward again. One doughboy would raise himself up on his elbows and look about. 
The Frenchman, very much excited, ran over to him and said, You must keep your head down or you will get shot. You must remember that bullets are flying all about you. As soon as the instructor's back was turned, the soldier was up on his elbows again. Hell, he said, there ain't any bullets. In later phases of training, the inferiority of the American to the French in imagination showed clearly. French veterans or recruits, for that matter, could work themselves up to a frenzy in sham battles and dash into an empty trench with a shout as if it were filled with Germans. Americans could not do that. They found it difficult to forget that practice was just practice. End of chapter 5